What's up, everybody? For this episode of the Years Truly podcast, I invited Nate Heil of Grail Country and Justin Wells from Justin's Morning Coffee YouTube channels, respectively, to have a conversation here and play host to them with the intent to discuss books and platform conversation from the Symbolic World Summit. We are all sputting around on Twitter a week or so ago about such things, and I asked them if we could just take this to an actual conversation. We worked out the details, so here we are. I hold both these men intellect and insight into the meaning crisis, philosophy, and culture with great and high regard. And I'm excited to host them in this conversation. So without further ado, I give you Nate Heil and Justin Wells. Hi, this is Christian Baxter, and you're listening to Yours Truly, a place we go to think out loud. Gentlemen. Hey, hey. 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 So, yeah, we were sputtering around on Twitter, and Nate said he was whining. I was. I was being a big cry baby. Like, nobody ever invites me to come and play. I was like, well, let's let's see if we can squeeze in some time. And, uh, and here we are. Like, I feel like you guys, y'all are, y'all are legit readers, and I, I can't call myself one of those people. Um, I'm a legit listener, but not like a legit reader. And so I wanted to get these two minds together. Like, y'all were both at the summit, but did y'all have any interaction at the summit, you guys? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. A little bit? Okay. Yeah. I, went I out to dinner, talked a little oh. bit, yeah. So mm-hmm. y'all did have it because I, I went to dinner with both of y'all, I guess, on the opposite times or something like that. But, um, but yeah, so what was, what was kind of the – who was – well, did you have a favorite? I think we know, Justin, your favorite was Martin Shaw. Nate, well, did you have like – Martin Shaw fans. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So Martin Shaw's why I came. Okay, I told so, John, and I told Jonathan that. So. <laughs> so yeah, we'll just talk about that phenomenon for this space for you guys and what that what's that what that has meant. Well, Nate's the reason why I became a Martin Shaw fan. It was okay. your interview, and uh, well, Sherry did an interview on your channel with him, and then just talking with you about Martin Shaw really got me into wanting to know more about it. So, I, I mean, how did you? How did you get into discovering him? Okay, I'm trying to think of how I first discovered Martin Shaw. Um, I think, goodness gracious, how did I first discover Martin? I actually can't remember. I really can't remember. I can tell you the first thing of his. I the first the first book of his that I listened to was Smoke Hole. Was the first one that I listened to. And I listened to it on audiobook. And as soon as I as soon as I listened to that on audiobook, then I started buying like every book of his that I could find. Um, and particularly, I went and saw. I found out that he had done a book on Parsifal, and my channel is called Grail Country. And not surprisingly, I have an interest in Arthurian legend. That's like lifelong, actually. Um, and so. I like definitely wanted to read that. And after I read that, I just had to talk to him. So, and I, and I read like, I read like in preparation for that first conversation I had with Martin, which focused on the snowy tower, which is his retailing of Parsifal. I actually read basically everything he had published to date in preparation for that. And I can remember that we were, we happened to record that conversation on Parsifal on the day that, uh, Queen Elizabeth II passed away uh-huh. because we actually had a discussion about it before um, we actually hit the record button on the conversation. Um, so yeah, that was the day. So so, and I've been following him like ever since. But I'm still trying to. I c- cannot remember for the life of me. I think it may have been. How did I? It might may have been through Malcolm Geit. I think because. Mal- I may have heard Malcolm Geit mention him. That might have sent me looking for him because he is a friend of Malcolm's. And in fact, one of the conversations I had with Martin at the summit was actually about something that Malcolm Geit had said that I wanted his thoughts on because I knew they were friends. So, What was that? Oh, so uh, Malcolm Geit in a couple of different podcasts has 
Well, first, the first one he, he talked about this was in his interview with uh, David Armstrong, who has the perennial digression substack, who was actually had a really, he had a, a lot of really awesome YouTube interviews for a while there before he just quit doing YouTube because he's, he's, he's an academic and he's more oriented toward being a writer. So it just wasn't his thing. And I think he talked to everybody that he really wanted to talk to. But he talked to Malcolm Guide. He talked to David Bentley Hart um, and a bunch of cool people. And in his interview with Malcolm and also with Common Toad's interview with Malcolm, the issue of how in North America, unlike in Europe, the, the, the folklore and mythology of the land never became integrated or synthesized with Christianity in the same way that it happened in the old world. And I, I wanted to ask Martin about it because Martin has written in numerous places that when he talks about myth, he says that he says that myths are, sto are not stories that we invent. They're stories that are overheard from the land. So when people don't form that kind of bond with the place that they're in, they're missing something very valuable. So our failure, our failure to do that work of integration and synthesis with the stories of the land that we inhabit is kind of, it causes some of the things that, that cause um, the versions of Christianity that we have to not be as deep as they could, to not have as deep as roots as it could to not to, because, because it's, it's not embracing a, it's not embracing a Christ that's big enough. It's it, 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 it's it, it's not embracing a Christ that like that we can understand to also be connected to these these things. Just as just as Christ is just as just as Lewis was convinced that Christ is shown in through the myths of the old world, we have to have the confidence that the same is true, and in, in in the myths that are whispered by the land that we happen to that we inhabit. And so Martin basically agreed with Malcolm. Not surprisingly, it's crazy. And I had a conversation. I had a, I did a recorded a, a podcast two days ago, and it was with a guy who was at Symbolic World. He's a worship pastor, but he's Albanian, and he's he he immigrated from Albania to Greece to the United States, and he was basically telling me that exact thing. He's like, I wish we could fast forward a thousand years to where America finally understands its myths or like has its own myths to kind of see what that would be like. But he, but also he was asking me as a born and bred American, like, well, what myths do you know about America? And I was like, well, I mean, it's like George Washington and the constitutional fathers and there's John Henry and Paul Bunyan and like, you know, but they don't like, they don't integrate as this thing. Like star Wars is more of an American myth than, than those things are, at least from my understanding right Justin. but what malcolm what malcolm was talking about is like you know it's not like there were people here right uh, <laughs> there were people here before before we got here mm -hmm. that were connected to this land and that did and that were listening to the stories that were whispered by this land but we haven't given them we haven't given them with there are some exceptions to this i would say that it has been done well like for example i think that the orthodox in alaska Hmm. did a very good like there's a there's a small example of the kind of thing that i'm talking about being done well but it hasn't but it that's really the exception right that's not the that's not the norm so like the orthodox did a good job of that in alaska uh integrating with the with the with the stories from the land there um but it hasn't we haven't done as good a job um generally in north america Justin, thoughts? Uh, well, what would be an example of that? W would you say like maybe something like Beowulf would be a good example of that type of integration? Yeah, yeah, yeah yes, exactly. And, and well, really, you, that kind of integration happened with like every European mythology. Like th that's why, and, and we still know those stories more than we do in as much as we know mythology. Most of us tend to know those stories more than the ones that are the stories of of our our land. And I and here's the other and I said this to Martin too, but it's like I'm not talking about in a way that like is patronizing or fetishizing. 
the native, right? That's that, that's not that's not productive, but we do need to listen. Which is very different. Which is very different. Mm -hmm. Would it also be related to the idea of like sacred places? You know, like, or, you know, how they talk about thin places or, you know, yeah. or, you know, mountains or underworlds or, or deserts or forests, you know, that, that have this kind of mystique to them that stretch back in storytelling over the generations. Um, a, it seems like there's a certain kind of um, map or landscape, mythological map or landscape. Right, because holy places, holy places, it, it turns out that holy places, like if you look at like where where we built churches in Europe, you know, if you look at a map of Europe and you look at where the churches were built, like a lot of the places the churches were built, they were considered for holy for a long time, like before a church was ever erected there. Mm. And there's something to that. And, and whereas, you know, we just will put, we'll just put a, a church in a strip mall. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So there's a lot of pieces. It's a, so do you, what do y'all see bringing Mark? What, and I guess Paul's Keegan's North, which I've only listened to the, um, the uh, surprising rebirth in the belief of God with him. And, and I haven't listened to, I don't know much of his other, work but like what you know people talk about this re-enchantment which that's like really pointing to that but what do y'all see that place in with stories like where that seems so far away from our current state of being as a culture but at the same time how do y'all see that getting bigger in in our culture well, I think for me, re the thing, the key with reenchantment is that reenchantment is not something that it should be that should be an expectation of something that we're waiting to see happen. It's something that happens to us. The enchantment is already there, right? It is it is we that need to transform ourselves in order to see it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I mean, yeah, I, I think it seems like it, it can, it can have, like, I'm thinking about the little church that I grew up in and it was, it was called church on the mountain mm -hmm. and it was in this beautiful little setting in a basin and the Sierra Nevada mountains of California were, were up above, you know, and it was this kind of like pilgrimage of sorts that people would go to partly because it was near the mountain, so you could snowboard or you could ski, but people would take youth groups there. They'd drive down from Reno or up from LA, you know? And I remember um, when um, there was different churches that were planted as offshoots of that in different locations, it didn't have the same symbolism or mystique as the one on the mountain, like physically on the mountain, you know? Right. And so I, I just know, like in looking back, I realized, yeah, that a, a lot of the, um, sort of like what was connecting people there, what was causing people to, um, it, for it to stick in their memories and for it to be this kind of um, fond memory of like a place where, where spiritual enlightenment happens. A lot of it actually had to do with the physical mountain that it was on, you know? And that was inadvertent kind of, you know, just that's where the church happened to be built. It happened to have that setting. It happened to have that name, et cetera. Um, or maybe providentially had those things. Um, but it wasn't a conscious decision to put it there, you know. Um, and then people might wonder, you know, I, I, I kind of joke around like I think my friends move churches about once every two years on average. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how faithful they are. They'll move about every at least after the at the two year mark. Very rarely will they stay longer at any one place than, than two years. So, you know. Yeah, there's something, you know, I, I feel like um, there's something that you would have to, you'd have to see something different, you know, to treat, to treat your spirituality a little bit different than we do now, which is, you know, I'm just going to go where it's convenient and easy for me. I'm not really going to think about some of these other, these other things. But I think that, that, that um, the reason why reading someone like Martin Shaw is so, captivating when he's talking about the forest or he's talking about 
you know, the wild twin, or he's talking about these things that are more connected to the earth, more connected to symbolism, more, more readily kind of like leading you into a story like um, existence where your life is kind of matching up to those stories. That's why it's so in captivating for people. They might not know why necessarily, or that, you know, they may not know what they're missing perhaps, but um, that's what's, I think that's what's going on. This reenchantment, it, it is something that's happening to people one by one, just little things at a, you know, little anecdotes at a time. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, I light a candle, I've got this Celtic cross, like, and then it's like all this modern stuff uh, wrapped around it, you know, be, but I take these, I take these to our little church um, because I, there's something real. And a few weeks ago, the lights went out and we were, we, we, we meet in a basement. This basement has 12 foot ceilings. It's a really grand house. And so it was like, literally it was like a candle and this little Celtic cross, like, and an acoustic guitar, <laughs> you know, it's one of those moments, but it's like, it wasn't attached to electricity. Uh, and there was something uh, very uh, enchanting about that and enchanting about candles. And when I talked a decade ago, over a decade ago, a friend of mine that came into our church who was already on this journey by himself, like he, he went from evangelical Mennonite church to a uh, Catholic church. And he came out and he would explain to me, he's like, this was like a candlelight dinner with Jesus. Like this experience. And, and I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like... <laughs> But that is, uh, in this world, I guess it is probably in some ways will be inevitable to the, the intensity of, of, of modernism, um, that we'll be longing for things that transcend it, I guess. And I think that is what, well, let, let me give you a simple, simple example. I've been thinking about this a little bit. Um, the, the act of burning incense. You know, yeah. so it's like, okay, so if you think like, um, oh, it's, that's kind of nice, you know, like if you think of it as, oh, that's kind of nice. Yeah, sure. You could put some incense on, you could have the smoke going up, you know, whatever setting that might be. Right. But if you think about the symbolism of it, you know, that this is connected to, you know, the, the sacrifice after the flood and when the smoke goes up and it's a sweet smell for Yahweh, you know, so, so this idea of connecting heaven and earth, you know, so it's like the thing below is now rising up and mingling with the stars um, is an appropriate thing to happen at certain points in the rhythm of your life, you know, and it, it's, it's like what I think, what I kind of think of it as now is kind of like where we were going from thinking, well, yeah, that's kind of nice. Like you could do that for some ambiance or something uh -huh. to like really understanding the importance of it. Or like um, I think at the summit, um, Richard Rowland was talking about lighting a candle when you pray, you know, why would you light a candle when it's not, hard, it's not easy to, to explain, but it's something that you do. Um, and so it's like these things that are like not really consciously rationally explainable, but they're ritualistic things that you do. Those are the things that in my opinion, that you lose with a, with a kind of, you know, left brain, hyper rational, pragmatic, um, outlook on life and you don't even notice that they're lost and then they, it's kind of even hard to figure out why you should bring it back um and so it's one of these things where you just have to kind of do it you know just put do some incense or something or do light a candle you know and that's the slow re-enchantment it'll do something to you that you can't explain and then and just that's it just just do it you know just try try right that that's a good point too because in order for the kind of transformation that I was talking about when I, when I first mentioned it to happen, that, that also isn't going to just happen. Right. <laughs> it requires, it requires that you, that you do something in order to initiate that transformation and those, and, and, and participation in, and, in, in these kinds of like ritual activities are like definitely like they've always been a pathway. Yeah. Um, yeah, and and it's it's also the uh, the Verveki participatory knowing, like of it is an embodied knowing of your faith. And I think that when when all these things got put into one big box of idolatry, uh, 
we lost the ability to participate in that part of knowing. Granted, there may have been some fairly good reasons for some of that reaction at times, but it's like uh, how to know God in, with our senses in a way that's more than only... I mean, well, that makes me think about having a good bass drum or a good bass guitar being a knowing of God through our senses. Like, <laughs> that's... That's all we, if that's all we have in a big room, like that's going to be the only thing that, that is literally connecting to our senses. Well, I, here's another example. I, I remember I was at a conference in St. Andrews one time. They have the, the, the theology, Institute for Theology, Imagination, and the Arts at St. Andrews, Scotland. And I, I was a young theology student, and I was pretty rational, I would say, in my approach to it. And they happened to have an artist come in and do, his, do a slideshow a, a photography show about something that he was working on and and basically what he had done is he wanted to understand death and so he went out into the woods and he watched a deer decompose for like a, a three days and photographed it the various stages of decomposition and he was kind of like talking and like putting up these photos and asking questions and i was just i remember just going like what is he doing like what it, this doesn't you know, he's making no points right now. He's not making any arguments for anything. He's just showing photos of a de decomposing carcass of a deer, you know. And this was before I think I really started to understand that everything is connected. So theology and biology are connected, you know. And but he um, felt that it was that you could learn something about the nature of mortality, death, physicality. I would even say something like garments of skin today, I'd use that term today, by observing the, you know, something like that and, and, and focusing your attention on something that you want to understand, focusing on it on the natural, you know, biological, physical realm. Um, this is what has impressed me about Martin Shaw going out on these, you know, sort of camping trips, uh, prayer vigils, um, uh, you know, being out in the in the woods and 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 looking up at the star, like again, that's something that you, us modern people, yeah, that's nice. You know, you get to go camping, you look up at the stars, you know. But he's doing it as a spiritual practice. Yeah. And and you just can't explain why that works or why that's important or it's it's something that you just kind of have to. It's just a part of the of of um, a, a part of your journey, let's say. You know these things, these types of things. Being, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, Nate. Oh, I was just gonna say one of those things that Martin, the things that Martin says is that civilization is only about four days deep. So that if you get yourself like disconnected from all of you know our modern conveniences and technology and communication <laughs> devices, if you can do that for even four days, you'll connect to something mm. that will surprise you. That. So I'm from rural Arkansas and uh, deer hunting and duck hunting are a huge part of culture and of my friends. And there's, and it is, it, you know, it gets, there's all sorts of dynamics at play with that in the culture with, you know, marriage and my husband's always gone hunting and all this stuff. But I've, I never was a part of that. Um, part of that was because I, we couldn't really afford to do that when I was younger. Um, but I recognize that for my friends that have experienced this, is something maybe their dad taught them these skills that they go out and do, and uh, and they know how to skin an animal and prepare it to be eaten, and they know how to all these things, uh, be responsible with a weapon, you know, you go out in the early morning and you can see your breath and, and the father and the son are there and this father teaches the son how to, you know, take the life of a wild game. I mean, there's just like, there's a lot going on there, a whole lot. And um, and I think it, it, it taps into uh, everything that we're talking about on a certain level. And But it's like, I think even back to Nate, your earliest point about uh, listening to the to the, uh, you know, the, the people that were already here, that type of thing. Like, 
and Peugeot's ordered life, like these things are, man, we like, we, like you said, we're, we're only four days disconnected from that to a degree, but like, but maybe like 40 years disconnected from that, even if we try to chart a path back towards how to put these things together. I don't know. Yeah. Um, it, you know, I grew up in rural Washington state, so kind of the same. Same scene. Oh, yeah. yeah, lots of woods. <laughs> lots, lots, lots of lots of woods. Lots, lots of deer hunting. Lots of duck hunting. Yeah. Because we also have a lot of swampy areas. Uh, yeah. uh, in Grace Harbor County, where I'm from, so um, fair amount of duck hunting as well as deer hunting, um, elk, also mm -hmm. elk hunting. Um, so I also never like my my dad was gay, so. <laughs> Big surprise that I didn't have a, I didn't have a dad to, who was going to take me hunting. It wasn't really his scene, so um, yeah. I, I just feel like it's. I feel like a lot of that's connected, but sometimes you know, uh, redneck culture ha has a certain um, connectedness to an enchanted part of reality. I think that's that's. I think is uh, overlooked, maybe. No. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, uh, enchanted rednecks. Yes. <laughs> well, I've been uh, I've been known to describe myself as a redneck who can read. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, so what was the what were other high points for you guys at the at the conference? As far as like maybe some of the platform stuff, I feel like you guys are able to intake some of that like categorically pretty well. Like I'm still interested in, in some of the feedback from you guys on that. I. I for like Ves Vesper Stamper's speech was just so encouraging and so resonant with with where my line of thinking had been. Because actually, it's funny because she talked about resurrection, and the thing that I came into the the, the thing that I came into the summit hoping to get a chance to talk to Jonathan about was about like how I I see the. Um, the closed circle of the Ouroboros as being a very different symbol from the spiral, which is connected to resurrection. And then Vesper talked about resurrection as a principle within the arts, which is interesting because that connects to, I, I shared with Justin earlier today, a piece that my friend, Dr. Chris Green wrote for his Substack, speakeasy theology. Um, yeah, he's from Oklahoma. So, <laughs> um, and uh i live in he, a dry county <laughs> <laughs> so my 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 grandfather actually got in trouble for uh um for running booze up from the mexico border uh, when he was a teenager in oklahoma so <laughs> anyway um uh, yeah uh but he wrote this piece about um uh pneumatology in, in the cinema and talking about the idea of like how in analyzing film, like there's been a lot of focus on Christology, but not on pneumatology. And I think that the spirit, the spirit is deeply connected to this idea of enchantment, right? To the good enchantment. Like this is, this is actually the, the good enchantment is in fact a work of the spirit. And there is a dark enchantment that can be the work of other spirits that are not the Holy Spirit too. But the, but the work of enchantment is definitely the work of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes this relates to the thing I was saying about the, about the, the tales from what was the tales from the land too, because it's, it's like, there has to be some kind of filtering because not all of it is going to be inspired by the Holy Spirit. But the, but I think that the problem is the base like line assumption of the people who settled this land and the missionaries was that it was just that all of it was bad. And so instead of like taking, taking what was good in it and integrating it, they just like, yeah, let's just, it's just, it's just all bad and push it all away. Um, so I think the arts play an important role in allowing people in, in, in this transformation process that allows people to begin to, to see what's already enchanted. Because like I said, it's like, the enchantment is already there. It's not it's so the idea that the world itself needs to be enchanted is I don't think is right. Because even even within the fallen world, there are still like there are still sparks of divine glory there to be seen if you have eyes to see them. And it's a pneumatological work in order to 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 do that transformation. So my question is, like Christian, you're a musician. 
Justin, you're you're involved in film. Like how how can our artists help to aid this process of transformation? Well, it, it's it's interesting that so I, I glanced at the um, at the description of that book that you sent me earlier today. Um, and, you know, I, I write in the field of theology and film. I studied under the Rob Johnston, who, you know, was kind of the main guy that started the field of theology and film. And you're right. It started off as mostly more Christological. And what people were looking for was um, Christ like characters or, or Christological figures within the movie. You know, this is why everyone got excited about the Matrix at first, you know, or whatever, you know, so they were, it was almost like a little grid, like a kind of like a, and they would hold it up to see if it fit that shape, if the story fit right. that shape, you know. And, and, and Dune, and then it turned out to be Antichrist, but. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big joke that, that he's playing on, that Frank Herbert's playing on everybody. Um, but uh, so, but the, the reason why I, we sort of moved away from it and, and the elders with me was because when I started teaching in film, it didn't really work as a creative technique because if you're giving a, if you're saying, okay, it's got to fit this formula, it's going to drain all of the creativity, all of the life out of it. And it's going to feel very formulaic. Fortunately for us, we started to all realize and um, discover all of the slow cinema types, which is Terrence Malick, uh, Tarkovsky, um, you know, much, much, um, you know, more um, experiential meditative experiences um, in the cinema rather than um, a plot that follows a certain shape or a character that has a, that does a certain action. Um, and so I think that there, there's something to that idea that, um, you know, I, I, you know, Tarkovsky, I remember him doing this shot of a tree and the roots of the tree and then going you know in the ground and then going all the way up the tree slowly 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 shot up the tree and all the way to the top um and then they're it's all connected to this bell that they want to put on top of the church that they they're, they're forging out of the earth and so it's like low and high connecting heaven and earth i had just finished reading the language of creation and, and i re re-watching this tarkovsky film and i thought you know what the nature has um, laden within it the symbols, you know, spiritual symbols. Like like a tree is not just a tree, you know. A, a tree is not just a, you know. A tree has a lot more going on than you and I can even understand, you know. A tree, a seed, the sky, the stars, uh, the ground, the earth, you know, the ocean, the sea, the water, fresh water, salt water. Like all of these things are just packed with meaning. Um, and we, you know, I think that you can, your eyes can be open in some sense or your ears open. You know, Martin Shaw says that it's, you know, a lot of it is listening, listening to the earth is what, you know, we keep wanting to see things, but maybe what we should do is listen, you know? So there's a sense of maybe some mini version of him who, who has eyes to see, let him see. He, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Something like that, that the artist can awaken. Um, and it won't be something that you can slam dunk and say like if you're trying to say here's a christological character and it's an argument that's airtight there it either fits it or it doesn't fit it. it's going to be more of an experiential thing where if you you know you can watch the tarkovsky film and think all i saw, saw was a tree or you can have an experience like i had where i thought that's the most profound tree i've ever seen <laughs> right well, yeah, I think that style of filmmaking, like it engages a different mode of attention, I think, because you can't just like, you cannot just watch a film like that. Well, if you watch, okay, I guess you can. If you watch a film like that and your only objective is to be passively entertained, then you aren't understanding the kind of attention that the film is wanting you to give it. Because it's wanting to give you, it's wanting, it's it's asking you to give a mode of attention that is not simply a passive mode. It's wanting you to engage in an active witness, which is, I I've said like I have I've said this is something I've been thinking about for a long time, like ever since Chino. This idea that like witness is connected to the poetic, and I would say by extension the art the artistic. Um, uh, 
um, vocation in general. Like there's like there's an element to it that is about that is that it's about witness. And and I mean something particular when I say that. I mean, it's like the when I say witness, I mean something that is enters into that mode of observation that is not merely passive, but is like it is simultaneously active and passive. That it that it is that it is patient and beholding and allowing for allowing for a, the epiphany or apocalypse that can be in any potential moment of observation and that is like that it never just it, it doesn't just come but it's like it's not the kind of effort that's effort either like it's kind of like there's a way in which it's like inevitably kind of mystical well that's that's when uh, Jordan Hall was talking to Verveki about the symbol on He's talking about an, an icon type thing of a taking you from this image or this object actually like having transcendent quality to allow you to pass through into um, to the person of God or something. <laughs> like I mean, like I I don't even know how to understand that completely uh, from a iconography, you know. But you know, one of the people big time in this corner that's his, that was his gig. So it's like. So it's like swirling around. But the other part of that for me, when you're asking about like the art, I, I've never I, I've struggled to call myself a creative for many years uh, because I was I was um, uh, covering music so much as a worship leader. Like I was just covering songs, just covering. You know, I didn't write this. I'm trying to play it as as close as I can to this thing. So uh, creativity, I I think I am a creative person, but I think that I. I don't know that 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 whole process was psychologically very difficult like um so but coming through here vesper stamper was also very inspiring to me um I, she said like pick up your paper and your pen or something like that and I, in my mind i said pick up your camera and i'm not i'm <laughs> not a i'm not a justin i'm not the camera guy i mean i have a camera here but like uh, what what kind of mimetically has come through with even with what I'm doing with YouTube is uh, I call this stuff conversation conversation craft, and I think what I what I've spent the last seven years doing was pretty much ingesting three you know one and a half to three hour conversations in chunks, um, and it did something to my brain. Uh, but also, so what now? I went to Jordan Peterson, John Pizzo, John Verveke University, and now how am I become a, a practitioner of this stuff? And this is kind of it like this. Uh, when you, when you listen to Joe Rogan, do something for three hours, even though some of it's silly and whatnot, but it's like, uh, uh, moving into a world where conversation craft is an actual thing. Like I like, and it is akin to the campfire. It is akin to listening. I think real conversation is, is about is is more about listening than it is about you know in a certain way that and that took and that's taken me a long time to to get there I had to, I had to gain some skills <laughs> mainly through therapy but yeah I would say that music is something that I I don't know how to I, I'm not it's a different vessel in my life right now I'll put it that way well you, you, I think would say just as just as like hearing is different from listening right when the, in the auditory there's also a difference between um between just seeing something and witnessing something, which is like, I noticed, I noticed how many times, uh, Martin used the word witness or, or witnessing in Bard Skull. He used it a lot. Mm. Um, I was, and I noticed it because I was already thinking about this before I came into this idea of like, um, that I kind of first started talking about in the conversation I had with Ted post Chino about like witness and the, and the poetic vocation which I use in a broad sense to not just mean poetry, um, to being connected. And one of the things that, one of the other things that decided to me is that that Vesper recommended, um, Heim Potok's, uh, novel, My Name is Asher Love, which I absolutely adore. <laughs> so I think I actually plotted, <laughs> like I can contain myself, but there's a, there's a very memorable scene in that novel where, so in the novel is about a, um, a young Hasidic man who's artistically gifted, and uh, there, you know, the it 
he comes from a religious tradition that is like anti-representation. Mm. You know, like it's a kind of classic tradition and he's a gifted artist. And so mm. there's a scene in the novel where he's studying art and he goes to, and he goes to he actually goes to Italy. And there's a scene where he's like where he sees the the Pietà, but he doesn't see the Pietà. He witnesses the Pietà in that scene because he a lot because because he allows he allows that that thing to speak to him so that it so that it's not it's not just a consumption right it's not it's not just a consumption but there's like an exchange or something that happens between which which is what you're kind of talking about with the idea with the icons too that jordan hall was talking about there's something that happens there's an exchange witnessing is always there is a wit. There is there is the there is the there is the thing that is there is the thing that is witnessed, and there is the one who is witnessing. And you can't have an act of witness without both. And so I think like in that is what all art is striving to be a witness to something. And the best art, even if it's not intended to be so, will always be a witness of the Holy Spirit because it will it will give it will give the one who has eyes to see a glimpse of the glory of God through that work. Does that, does that make, or do I sound like a crazy person? Is that? No, that makes, that, <laughs> okay. That makes okay. Perfect. I mean, this is, um, this is the tool that I, you know, I haven't been using the same words. Um, I've been using the word test testify to testimony that's in my book. There's a chapter on testimonial documentary filmmaking. And it, I'm essentially making the same point, which is that if you find a truth and you you think that this truth should be given back to the community, like a little golden nugget that you found in the ground, you're going to testify to this thing by making this, let's say, this documentary. You know? um, so witnessing, you know, because I, 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 I really think that if you were in, you know, the Middle East at the time of Christ and you saw him, you may not have actually seen him. You may have right. been an ordinary man, you know. Yeah. So you can't see. Yeah, it's like there's very, very, um, you could say, profound um, things <laughs> in the world um, that you can see, but only if you your eyes are open to see them. And it, it could be something as small as the tree that I saw in the Tarkovsky film. Yeah. Um, or it could be the Mo, uh, Michelangelo's Moses that I spent a good, you know, 30 minutes looking at when I went to Rome because there's no crowds around like the Pieta, you know. Mm. And, and there's something about, okay, this guy made this out of marble and he took forever to do every single little detail in his expression as he's turning, right, as he's seeing the golden calf. That's the moment that of this Moses that Michelangelo created. And you think about that, you think, okay, well, what's so important about that moment that he spent all this time crafting this beautiful piece of marble into that moment? And that's when you're gonna now start to witness the profound truth of that situation. Almost only because it's like you 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 have you you click out of that kind of like consumer, you click out of the mode of um, obstacles and opportunities, you know, like, like Jordan Peterson talks about obstacles and opportunities is usually how you see the world. I want a sandwich. I'm looking for a sandwich a sign that says food. That's what I'm so and then someone's in my way, I go around that person and I get to the where I want. But the witness, it seems like what you're saying, or part of what you're saying, perhaps is that the, the witnessing activities where you you're not in that mode anymore. You're not in the looking for what I want mode. Yes, that's exactly it. Because you're not you're not you're not looking at the thing for its utility to you. You are you are getting a glimpse. You are getting a glimpse of the thing as it is as it truly is. You are get, like you actually can't. So even though we might not be able to rationally explain what the thing in itself is, we can through the act of witness. We can experience it and the only and we need to use art to try to express it because we can't articulate it because it's beyond what we can we can rationally articulate we so so the only so art is the best tool that we have 
to try to express that. And it is also one of the best tools to generate that and put people in that mode of experience. But it's not the only way. So, for example, I have had this sort of experience with impersonal interactions with people before, too, where usually like I'll, I'll be having an interaction and I'm usually in a state where by my own natural perception, I'm in that moment irritated, annoyed, um, not in a positive frame of mind at all about the person that I'm interacting with. Like, for example, I had this happen once when I was on a, I was on a long bus trip and I was trying to read a book and this drunk homeless guy was pestering me. Okay. So if you were to have filmed the scene with a camera from one moment to the next, the camera would not have seen anything different. Okay. But, but when I looked up from my, my book, like completely unbidden and unbeknownst to me, I saw that man's face as radiantly beautiful. And like the thought occurred to me, like in that moment, oh, the world exists for this person. The world exists for this person. And the the only like like and it was just for it's just for this fleeting moment. It's like it's never it's never lasting. It's just like it's like just like God gives gives your you just like this very brief experience of what the person that you are irritated by looks like from his point of view to like show you the contrast. Um, and that is what happens in the act of witness. Like we, that the act of witness, it allows us to see the thing for what it really is and not what we're putting on it with our desire to use it or, you know, whatever, whatever it is. It's like, no, we're seeing the thing as it as it truly is and the thing as it truly is is the thing as god sees it like how, how god intends it and not how we intend it i wonder if that's where martin shaw coming into some sort of realization of his conversion uh with something that he bore witness to that he couldn't quite make sense of initially mm -hmm. in I don't remember. I think it was in his conversation with Paul Vanderclay when he said, now it's time for me to be, this story's not my own anymore. It's time to go out and be one of God's little worker bees is what he said. That really impacted me because I kind of had a similar situation and, and trying to like understand this thing, understand this thing. Well, what if I'm just like, I mean, this is bearing witness to truth. You know, and that, you know, when I've reached out to you, Justin, like this idea, like what's bearing witness to the truth? What is testifying to the truth? Like what is, that's kind of, it's been my kind of experience with, with that. And, and, and why, and that's kind of been my, my uh, connection to Martin Shaw was through his, his testimony, you know, testifying to something that happened to him. Um, and I don't know, I think from reading his stuff, when, so he's, he's, had, he's been a, fairly prolific writer like I, something i was wanted to ask you i haven't looked this up for myself but is um in the timeline of his his work his work like he, he's been kind of i guess a, what he would say he's kind of came back or come home to christianity in the last two years um has he written in the last two years or so what all his stuff is pre or kind of post that something i was curious about uh no he's continued to write um he's published bard skull since his since his conversion okay um and and he's still i mean and he's very he's uh uh he's got his Substack is great too by the way i totally recommend it he and he does um um the house of beast and vines is the name of the Substack, and he does um you know storytelling like he'll read he'll read the things on his on his uh sub stack too in fact he's getting ready to start parsifal which probably won't just you justin since you're reading snowy tower on sunday oh wow so 
yeah, you may want to check that out. Well, Smoke um, Hole was uh, twenty twenty one. Yeah, twenty twenty one. Yeah, that's so that that was like. Um, yeah, according to Wild Twin, which is this one, was twenty twenty. Yep. When He's, was his conversion? He said around two years ago. I think is what I've heard. It's or yeah. Least, I think uh, yeah. So it would have been. I think it was. It was. He mentions it was during COVID. So it's like twenty 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 one somewhere like in that ballpark. So fairly recent. He said something really telling. I thought that connected to me, right? Because I think like my my pathways to to back home to Christianity are are very similar to Martin's mm. pathways. I've always been like a big you know mythology guy, yeah, big folktale guy. Um, so our reading lists have a lot of overlap. Even some surprising, like I saw the reading list. I saw the reading list uh, that he put out uh, from the summit, and like one of the books that I was surprised to see on there was um, a book that was recommended to me by one of my professors at Evergreen in the fall of 1989 that I read mm -hmm. on her recommendation. It's a book called From Scythia to Camelot that was written by um, um, Linda A. Malcor and C. Scott Littleton. That is about, uh, it's about a theory that the, um, uh, some of the Arthurian material actually may trace to the Nart sagas, which are originated in the Caucasus region. Um, and this professor at Evergreen was, uh, she was, she was Russian and she was Orthodox. And so she, she was very, she was very into this theory and she knew I liked Arthurian stuff. And so she recommended it to me. She also organized a field trip to Russian Orthodox Church for huh. our Great Books program when we were studying the Tale of Igor's campaign. This beautiful old uh, historic um, uh, Russian Orthodox uh, Church in Wilkinson, Washington, and they have Slavonic, they have old Slavonic liturgy there. And so, since we were studying a work that was originally written in old Slavonic, she thought it might be uh, nice for us to get, you know a feel for like the culture and the sound of the language by mm. going and attending um, an old Slavonic liturgy while we were studying the text. I'm going to, I'm going to go back to an early part of conversation where we talked about everything being so Christological in, in how that some, for some reason, like seems to like rob the, the creativity of something uh, in art. Mm -hmm. And this also goes back to um, kind of bringing in I don't. I'm, I'm interested, Nate, in your fascination with the um, uh, King Arthur, but also um, when I, I had this conversation with this guy who was at Symbolic World, he's a, he, that I said came from Albania to Greece, and he said, you know, Albania has. It's funny when he was listening to Martin Shaw talk about uh, the 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 one of the stories he told about the seven mountains of something, and then he said, in our country, it's the five mountains, like in our tale. Like they, there's these overlapping of, of, uh, of myth. And yes. the other, the other thing that he said was that this goes to the, to the Christological thing, which was, yeah. which I've been like intuiting, like being kind of so formed in, in the, what was called the gospel center mu movement with, um, in Christianity with, uh, like every, every story is Christological. And Justin, I know is more familiar, I think with that world with, uh, the young restless and reformed type stuff is like, and in the Presbyterian church and stuff. But he was saying that these stories, they map onto our life. And he was talking about like the patriarchs and how the, the patriarchs can kind of represent, you know, the, in Justin's world, like these seven, the, these different kinds of plots um, that, that we get and that how I'm trying to pull these ideas together that, there's more to the human story and the human condition when we recognize them in, in humans that are looking to Christ, but not that all everything that we should be relating to is Jesus Christ because he's God or something like that. I don't know if that... <laughs> that well, no, actually, this, I'm glad you, you actually brought me back on track to the point that I started to make before I sidetracked myself <laughs> by my meandering way of talking sometimes. I have no idea how I did that. <laughs> And that is the thing that it's a thing that Martin said in the conversation that he had with Sherry, my co-host over at Grill Country, where he said his realization, one of those realizations he has in coming back to Christianity and realizing just how big Christ was 
is that Christianity was the big shamanism he had always been looking for. Mm -hmm. So he had been looking for, he had been, he, he had seen the pattern of unity in all these, all these stories, right? He had seen the pattern of unity in all these stories that he'd been studying, but it, it took that epiphany of the mossy face of Christ for him to see that the unity that he was seeing that the Christ is what it was pointing to. So that, that big thing that like that, that that connects all the spirits in the hierarchy in, in their proper order and the saints <laughs> and, right exactly yeah is what what was christ all along um but he had to to he had i mean it had he had to go through the pathways he went through to be able to see that and my for me it's much the same it's like m my thing was the way i express it is like it's not so much it's it's that I realized I had been a Christian all along yeah. and that the, but I didn't know that the thing that I was looking for like I didn't know that it was Christ but it definitely was thoughts Justin well I mean I, I think it's just it's like getting past the the thumbnail low resolution projection you know like the thumbnail low resolution projection of let's say Christ yeah. is what in people's minds you know it, it might be associated with all, any number of cheesy yeah it's just or, it's you know. it's well actually there's a line from a song that i loved when i was young and i kind of still love it because there's a lot there's a lot of good impulse in it it's uh, it's a uh, it's a song it, the song operation spirit by the band live right mm -hmm. where there's a line in the song where it says like th there's a line about um there's a lot of talk about this Jesus, a man of love, a man of strength, but what a man was 2,000 years ago means nothing at all to me today. Well, that's true. If that's all Jesus is, is a man who lived in Palestine 2,000, 2000 years ago and nothing else, then it doesn't mean anything at all to you. You have to, you have to come to see Christ as the image of the living God that is in all of these other things as well before it, the pieces like fit together and it and, and he becomes a living christ to you i think it's kind of like when you think you know a let's say a celebrity but mm -hmm. you've never met them in person so you have some kind of projection of who they are in your mind and that's mm -hmm. and it's and that's all it is for you you know mm -hmm. and for, for a lot of people I, you you could say christ is a a word you say to get status or it's a, you know, whatever, some kind of a tool right. in your life or something. But then when you meet the real person, you go, gosh, you know, they're nothing like what I thought they were. I thought, you know, I had an image of them in my mind. I had even their voice patterns in my mind, but they're nothing like what I thought. So there's a, a certainly a difference between meeting the logos and whatever projection you have, whatever low resolution projection you have of, of who you think Christ is. And I can say that it's a good, it, you know, that's probably why people don't really like movie portrayals of Christ mm -hmm. because it plays into this low resolution. You know, right. I mean, how can you show yeah. the logos in a movie? You know, like it. Right. it, it so I, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm always of the, the idea that the reason why it's so hard to, to put these biblical stories into movie form, or even you know, novel form or whatever, you know, is because it's the light. It's like you're, you're looking right at the light, you know? Right. Which is why I think there's still a place for the, for the folktales and the myth, because you actually, you do get it, but you get it, you get it. You, 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 it's like the, it's like the, 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 the line from the, the, uh, the Emily Dickinson poem, like tell the truth, but tell it slant. Right. So when mm -hmm. in the, in the, in the myths and the folktales, you're going to encounter Christ. But you're gonna encounter him slant, and but here's the thing though, if you allow those things to work on you, they will end up giving you like a fuller picture than this sort of like reduced caricature kind of image. That's really because interesting. it really is in all things. <laughs> that makes me <laughs> that makes me think. You know, Peugeot going into fairy tales and comics, and Martin Shaw not telling a Bible story. At South, you know, at Symbolic World. Um. Well, I mean, if, for example, you could take Lord of the Rings, you know, and you could say mm -hmm. Aragorn. So, prophet, priest, and king. Uh, Aragorn 
Frodo and and Gandalf, you know. Right. And 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 I remember there was a time where in the theological circles that I was in, they were people were criticizing Lord of the Rings for not having a proper Christ figure and splitting mm -hmm. it up between the three. Right. But to me, I'm going, no, that is exactly what you need to do. Right. Because <laughs> it, I mean, Did if you you're going to, right. Because you're, because that's how you fight <laughs> yeah. against the caricature Christ that yeah. people have in their heads mm -hmm. is yeah. like, you, you, you don't let them know what you're doing, which I think is what, this is why Tolkien criticized Lewis for, how heavy handed his allegory was in the Narnia series. I think Lewis, I think Tolkien was wrong. I think Lewis is way more clever in that than Tolkien gives him credit for, but I, it's, but it's a legitimate criticism because the idea that you shouldn't, you should not be absolutely direct about it is actually in fact the right approach. Well, that, that was the, that was the, one of the biggest things I picked up from Martin and, and Justin. And we had this conversation, I think too, was about uh, leaving, leaving room like leaving space for the imagination or, or whatever. I, I'm curious. I, well, I, go ahead if you want. No, to. that's good. Be that leaving room because that's, that's a, what, what we were talking about earlier when we were talking about the kinds of films that, that, that Justin was taking about. That's what those films are doing. Yeah. They're, they're, which is why they they more readily allow the, the, the person who's watching the film to engage in that different mode of attention than just like the, you know, I'm sitting here watching the latest, you know, like Transformers movie or whatever. <laughs> and that, yeah, that's the, the leaving the space. And I guess my, the, the question, you know, why, why for a, the, it begs this to me is um, why iconoclasm and why, the need for um like when these things get so buried i guess from it's easy for me i say easy maybe justin to bring our extremely formed christological upbringings and training and theologies into these myths and then be able to be like okay yeah let's separate this a little bit this is a little stuffy but if that's all you've had, like you probably, maybe you need a little bit of extra Christ <laughs> to come in. And, and it's almost like when you, when all these evangelicals go into orthodoxy, like Martin Shaw, like it's so inherent to his Pentecostal upbringing or charismatic upbringing that it's, it, it informs these things. Um, or even Father Stephen or even Jonathan Peugeot, like they're bringing so much jesus jesus you know like <laughs> into these things and i think that's that's important to to consider I mean, as martin a, as shy is so still still so pentecostal i got news for him he very <laughs> no really if you look like if you just look at what he does like when he's on the stage and he's doing a storytelling he's very much someone who is trusting the spirit <laughs> and letting the spirit move him like a hundred percent for sure. There's something very Pentecostal about what he's doing. So yeah, I just think I think that that's when you you talk to some people that say say I go to a you know very historical symbolic worship and and uh, or even so my mother in law who came out of Latin Mass and this very high church and she's looking for the person of Jesus to connect to actually, but all of that is informed by this great mythic and symbolic. History. It's just also. It's like this, this dance that I I think is. Well, I think it's really cool. I think it needs to happen, and I think that. Um, I don't know. I think that's what's so good about what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. I guess I don't know. I don't know, guys. Um. Well, maybe that's a good place to land, Justin. Are you needing to? You were kind of having some time. Well, I don't know. Yeah, I have a heart out at five thirty, but. You okay. Know. Oh, so we're good. So we're good. We can keep going. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Good. 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 Well, go, what were you going to say, Nate? Oh, I was just going to say. So, um, I would say, what's I would say what's interesting about this moment is that, like, particularly in TLC, you can see a lot of like genuine appreciation for the variance of the forms. 
yeah within the broader church right so you can like people can you know maybe go and buy an icon or two without necessarily leaving their you know you know non-denominational charismatic church (laughs) right don't leave your church (laughs) right yeah you know or 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 can and can so and appreciate there's a genuine appreciation of the of the beauty of other branches of the tradition and i think that's a really good thing i think that's a really good thing and i think it's a good thing because i think that's just i think that's like we're different (laughs) You know, we're all very different and there are different, different modes of, of, of that work for different people. Well, that's like a, that's like a lay ecumenicism. Yeah. Yeah. I think like that's in a more subsidiarity, subsidiarial version of that. I mean, that's how I kind of feel, but like... it's interesting though, because it's this feels different to me. It's like okay, it's this feels different to me. So, so for me, it's like if I were to trace out the history of like ecumenicism in America, Paul like said something about World War Two. I don't know if I really buy that. To me, the thing that like maybe a little bit because we had to set aside our differences in order to fight a world war together. I don't think that was the big thing. It was actually like the the reagan revolution and the like galvanizing of the anti-abortion forces that really caused like the kind of ecumenicism that's just tolerance where it's but what's going on now is not this that's way deeper than that because this this has gone beyond mere tolerance to like genuine appreciation care and yes genuine appreciation and care without and simultaneously without the at least for some of us without feeling the need to like need to to do to do something different like i don't feel the need to leave my anglican church and go become orthodox even though i appreciate so much of what's coming out of the orthodox world and the beauty of it yeah that, and, that's what paul paul really modeled <laughs> that really well yeah you know, he just yeah. Gets, look where it's okay you can be whatever you are it's okay <laughs> You know, well, yeah, pressured, you know, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, Paul's Paul, Paul such a great example of that because it's like, I mean, it's like, why, how would it, in what world would it make any sense for Paul Vanderclay to stop being a, 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 a member of the CRC when he has this generational deep connection to it? Like, that would be, I mean, on it, like, that would be like like if you for anyone who's like serious about any kind of like valuing of tradition at all that would be like a super like non-traditional uh radically you know individualist thing to do yeah and there's a very big difference from trying to sort that out and maybe hopefully some of these 20 year olds that make that kind of dogmatic stance you know if they they're starting you know trying to get into that lineage of their self if they carry that out for the next 40 years i mean good for them you know Absolutely. um but it, but then also um the you said the the tolerance and then like the care or the, the i think that the what 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 i mean just this conversation but but even symbolic world and, and even what jordan peterson did when now it's like well all these people just went to church. Maybe that a lot of them went to Catholicism and a lot of them are headed to Orthodoxy or something. It's like, just went back to church. Like, I mean, and there, and there, and a lot of them, like I listen to Neil talk. If that was your experience, you're actually not bringing this whole cradle thing with you. You're bringing just like Christian faith. And so then when you're like, well, I'm not calling Neil stupid, but you're, you're still naive and naive if, as a Catholic or something to look over and be like, well, I mean, they're Christian too. They believe in Jesus. You know, like there's like a good naivety to the, all these downstream from Peterson, um, which I'm not saying Neil's naive either, but it's just like, uh, down, like, uh, with what I've seen go on in that, in that, this space. And, and even just the fact that Jonathan Peugeot will say, just, you know, just go to church. You know, it's mm-hmm. just like, that's actually very, very powerful, and and 
I will say I had some conversations with, uh, well, I had, I it came out with Lance. I did a, a Lance Cleaver, uh, yours truly it came out today. And, and we were talking about uh, liturgical forms in worship. And of course I still play acoustic guitar and I still play a lot of these, some of these newer songs in this thing, but I'm this thing I'm kind of been doing, but there were some, uh, a couple of guys that, that hang around in the, in the corner that were kind of like, you know, what were we knocking on um, basically, you know, modern forms of worship. And I didn't want it to come across that way, but the, it's like when you do get down into like the, how, well, how do we do this? Then it, then sometimes there's like some, you know, friction or whatever, but, um, but I, the interesting thing about some of that happening on YouTube is that you're not doing that together. You, you, you know, that's, that's on this side of things or something. I don't know. Whatever. But well, I mean, it's, my brain. It's, it's a difference between having someone on your front porch and having them in your living room. Uh -huh. you know, obviously when you're inside your own space, your more intimate space, then of course it matters more. Mm. And, but, but that doesn't, but you know, you're not going to invite everybody into your living room. You know, you're, you, there's space for the front porch, the, the market, the, you know, the, the cafe down the street, the living room, and then the kitchen the or the bedroom, yeah. you know, like there's various levels of intimacy. Yeah. And so you can think of, you know, your faith as sure. You're going to have one that where the people you're most intimate with and are going to agree with you the most, obviously have the most points of agreement or, you know, common practice. And then it'll get looser as you move farther away from your, you know, your, your space when you go out in the hallway or go out you know then of course you know you you don't have to agree on everything and you can find the common you, you're it's a different kind of relationship right know? yeah yeah and, and i think of the ultimate level of that is like you know i was actually I was thinking about this justin because i spent this past saturday um with a group of people from my wife's synagogue they like my wife's synagogue decided to do a sabbath observance together they did it but rather but rather than do it but, but they did it actually at a camp and so like they were invited to come and like stay the night friday night and then have all the whole day together on saturday my wife had to travel for work and so we weren't able to go friday night but we did arrive on saturday morning so i had like no cell phone the entire day um um although it wasn't a it wasn't a requirement my, my wife is reconstructionist so it's like Observance is good, but if you're not perfectly observant, also not a big deal. So, uh, but my wife is like one of the more observant people in her. So she definitely was like no cell phones. So she told me to bring books with me and we spent the entire day. And my wife's congregation leans like, first of all, they're Jewish. They're not Christian. Second of all, they lean very progressive. Okay. But my the at the end of the day spending this wonderful day with my wife you know being at services with her while she's worshiping with her with her synagogue and uh doing uh uh doing musar um classes um and uh um just like having some quiet time to reflect and to read and having this perfect day at the end of the day my thought was these are people who are sincerely seeking god Mm. right that was like that was like the that was the bottom like the bottom line the baseline they're sincerely seeking god Th there was no doubt in my mind about that even though it's very different if i compared to like my own church which is uh it's an acna church so not surprisingly like for an acna church it's going to lean much more conservative but when i'm with that group of people what i also see fundamentally bottom line is a group of people that are sincerely seeking god yeah and i think that it the way i i kind of am seeing this and even as we were talking about this i was just kind of like uh you know just a, a hierarchy of a value of meaning and it doesn't it just because so say there's this high point and say it's orthodoxy or latin mass or whatever you know that's fine and and say you're you're not in that space. That's also fine too. Be earnest. You know, uh, try to find deeper meaning where you're at and, and stuff. I guess, and that, like even uh, Justin's illustration of the front porch made me feel like, like that, like brought to mind. Like I sit on my front porch with my guitar and I, I sit on my porch swing and I just 
I p- play songs sometimes when the weather's nice, you know, and it's like, um, you know, but, and then the whole neighborhood can hear that, but the whole neighborhood doesn't get to come into my living room, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> Here's the thing. I just, let, just let me say this really. I'm yeah, sorry. go for it. I just, I'm just really excited. I want to say this. That's so cool. <laughs> so, man. so whether you're in whether you're in your living room, out on your front porch, or out in the street, or at the shopping mall, or wherever wherever it is that you are, you can always bring love with you. Mm. And if you're bringing love with you, that will transform wherever you are. Right. And so I was thinking I was thinking about this deeply because I just I just did a class with uh, my friend Jordan Daniel Wood and he shared this um, letter of Maximus that he had recently translated. And there's this extraordinary little part of the letter where Maximus talks about how love contains all good things. So if you are if, if you if you're worried about lacking faith or you're worried about lacking hope. If you pursue love, the faith and the hope will come. Yeah. Because love contains all good things. So that's just <laughs> say that. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, if you read Isaiah 60, you'll see a version of that in terms of everything in the world. You mm-hmm. know, so, you know, Isaiah 60 is the new Jerusalem. And in the, in the new Jerusalem are the cedars of Lebanon, the ships of Tarshish, all of the kings of the earth are in this city you know and it's like well well, i thought i thought you know the ships of tarshish were bad it's like well apparently there's something good about them because there's part of them that's there in the in the in this eternal reality you know Mm. so there's so i think that's how it is with everything is you know there's there's um it whatever it is that's good about it makes it into the eternal you know and it comes from all kinds of different places yeah Amen. This there's just something that's kind of touching on this. Um, how does the difference? I don't. It's, I don't want. to Part of me is like I don't want to have this conversation. Uh, but, oh, then you got to do it. That means you have to do it. <laughs> love, love, and judgment, and. Um, Yeah, like love and what that brings us, like, how do we, because, I mean, we're like, we're flirting with the universal right now, and the, you know, like in this language of, of universal redemption, mm-hmm. to, Justin, to Justin's point, and to, uh, and there is, you know, there in our New Testament biblical narrative, there is like a redemption er- narrative for Israel, and, um, and I do feel like, at least from the culture that I've come from, like, and, and this is a lot of deconstruction within Christianity, blah, blah, blah. But it's like, there has been so much fear, like, it's almost a fear to love too much, I guess you could say, in a certain way. Because, oh no, what if I love too much? Uh, <laughs> I don't know, what? like, with that, without... What? Ju- What's Without judgment, I I mean people well, like, I guess you know like if you're coming from like like maybe know, like, yeah I mean that would be back like forty years ago yeah and and then like heavy metal music love yeah, it. And, yeah and and uh, yeah be, be beware of loving certain things too much I guess or something I don't know but what does it look like let's let's just let's lose that let's just roll with that because my son's a big metalhead so let's roll with the heavy metal music for example what does not just consuming let's not we're not like like not just consuming heavy metal music in like uh an addictive like reciprocally narrowing fashion but what does loving uh, heavy metal music look like and would that be a bad thing if you're truly loving it mm-hmm. because if you're loving it then you have to be seeing the good that's in it and be trying to maximize that goodness that is in the thing that you love. That otherwise, might, it's not. Otherwise, it's not love. That might be something like participating, learning, learning how to play, getting a band, and, and you know, and then performing this thing, like embodying the thing that you love too. I guess. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I, I think of it in terms of the ships of Tarshish. You know, like why, why in the world are the ships of Tarshish in the New Jerusalem in Isaiah sixty? Right. Right. It's like, well, because even the ch- ships of Tarshish have 
something that belongs in the in that eternal world of goodness even the ships of Tarshish, even the cedars of lebanon even the foreign kings. well and it's know? definitely hint- it's definitely hinted that it is that is actually that 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 the that the horror of babylon is actually transformed mm. so all the more reason to have the ships of Tarshish there so i mean if you know if heavy metal let's say you could take a Jungian approach and you could say that heavy metal is this expression of the shadow um the primordial kind of that guttural you know instinctual expression okay um which is vis- visceral um War- warrior even right and so okay but that but the shadow side needs to be expressed you can't just repress it you know mm-hmm. so what 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 is you know this is martin shaw when he talks in the lindworm story about the worm that they that, that in the story she acknowledges it and then it starts to shed its layers and eventually underneath it it's a is a man right and, and so, so you can so you can transform it from an impulse to do violence into a drive to cre- to productively create or a drive to positively yeah. express yeah yeah, if you yeah. wanted to even go to Dune, that's that's when he's riding the worm, you know. Yeah, yeah. He's really yeah. <laughs> taking the thing of chaos, yeah. and now he's riding it and using that power for yeah. his, you know, pointing it in a in a let's say a positive direction. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely true. It's like all these things that bring well and bringing things into the light so that we can see them for what they are, and you know, and and um, and behold them even back into your witness right and this is like i think like someone like i have this very strong intuition that like one like the thing that we are supposed to be doing as human beings in our role in the creation is to be raising things up the hierarchy of being yeah. and this is the this is the mode that we need to this is the mode mm-hmm. that we need to connect to in order to do our job <laughs> How does uh, I, I, dude? I'm with you. Like that's that's what I that's that's what I feel. That's how I feel. Like I yeah. about even being somewhat of a liminal figure in my life, how I've operated. It's kind of like I think it was Verbeke saying something like, "Yeah, we, maybe we're holding the door open, but we haven't like gone in." And that would be from saying things like you know, universal religion to a specific religion. But maybe me saying from a, a in that hierarchy from a lower uh form of of uh you know participation of of symbolic meaning pointing to a higher form of symbolic participation a higher meaning in worship and i don't does that have anything to do with your your fascination with arthur i'm still king arthur i'm still i want to know a little bit more about that uh my fashion well or so, guess grail or grail, grail country for yeah uh my fascination with arthur I, I one of the books that i so my my imagination in my youth my very early days was formed by a few things um i was read to i i, I had george mcdonald stories read to me i had c.s lewis read to me and i had tolkien read to me and then as soon as i was able to start reading on my own one of the first things I read was uh, a Howard Pyle collection of Arthurian myths, and I've been I've been kind of obsessed with all things Arthurian and 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 knightly and chivalric ever since. Well, that but makes... I do think that yeah, this like that transformation of the that transformation of the warrior impulse that we were just talking about. That I would say like the the sophianic transformation of that which is what i think the grail stories are about that is precisely like that's what that's what leads to the kingdom ultimately like that's how the kingdom comes and so even nate the football player into nate the philosopher <laughs> what, what about you like so sophianic wisdom i don't know uh You'll have to watch the girl. <laughs> that's too long for this. We're yeah. the time we have left. That's just, yeah, but it's so, uh, <laughs> yeah. you have to watch the grill country back catalog for that. But no, it's connected to the figure uh, in Proverbs eight. Um, but um, uh, under the influence of um, uh, 
uh, Russian sociology, um, w w thinkers like uh, Vladimir Solovyov, uh, Sergei Bulgakov. Um, essentially, the the idea it's complicated. <laughs> we'll have to talk about it some other time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was gonna try to do like a really con condensed version, but yeah. it doesn't. Yeah. Part two: Finding the Grail. Finding the Grail with Nate. I will say this very simple thing about it, though. Ultimately, ultimately, because like Michael Martin, Michael Martin, who calls himself a sociologist, he's also big into sociology, obviously, because he calls himself a sociologist. Ultimately, for my, for Michael and I, it's less about like attempting to work it into systematic theology than it is about like the witness of the. This act of witness of the creation, the glory of the creation as God intended, shining forth, and the and and acts of poesis, like that's really more the core of sociology as I would talk about it or Michael would talk about it, and we're less we're less we're we're less interested in the systematic theology bits of it. So. I'll 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 end it pointed directed at uh, Justin with this because we're coming up on his time, but like. I'm seeing so much buzz on Dune, which I had watched the 80s version of Dune. I, I've read the book a few years, the original book, a few years ago, listened to basically cliff notes on the rest of it. And it seems like it's capturing people's imaginations in a very, very powerful way in the culture right now. Like, especially with the second one is coming out. I just got a message from a young friend. And you and I, when we talked last, Justin, uh, we were talking, like I told you about my son watching Indiana Jones for the first time, and it just cap it just made sense to him as a seven year old, captivated his imagination. Like, are we about to see? Because do you think we're about to see so much more returning to this simple story of searching for the Grail of meaning, for the Grail of uh, these symbols? You know, within our. I mean, do you think that's a, we're about to just like tip that cinematically? Well, or, I, the, the, Dune is, a, you know, I don't want to spoil it, but but Dune, if you you just got to look up at what Frank Herbert was up to. His critique was, on religion, wasn't it? He was obsessed with religious cults and yeah. cult leaders, and wanted to know how why the the uh, messianic story was so captivating enough to cause people to drink the Kool Aid, and so he wrote it in a way to capture to almost seduce the reader in to realizing oh my gosh i would have fallen for x y and z cult leader because i like the story so much you know so you have to understand what he's doing he is not resetting the story he is uh, he's the anti-story it's still an anti-story but it's, in it's, that it's it's the quintessential anti-hero yeah. like 1965 no oh, it's anti-christ Let's be blunt. Yeah. It's an antichrist story, yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, which is very different. If you want to see a work of science fiction that does precisely the opposite and actually presents a genuinely messianic story, that would be Gene Wolfe's new Sun series. Gene, oh wait, let me write that up. Gene Wolfe. Gene Wolfe, yeah. Okay. Gene Wolfe was a Catholic, and it's he's quite intentionally writes it as a religious allegory i mean you might be able to say something interesting about the idea that um we, you know why that story is so powerful and even when frank herbert is trying to um sh like try to showcase it as a tool of control a, a tool of um you know f you know for like a an antichrist figure like a cult you know why is that story so compelling you know you, you could kind of go at like a sociological approach to that movie, you know, or to that story, you know, um, but it is definitely not. Um, it's definitely postmodern. <laughs> well, yeah, because, well, the Antichrist is an image like Antichrist is like, it's not just that it's opposed to Christ. He also imitates Christ. So it's like, yes, it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the shiny mm -hmm. object that we fall for. That's well, why. And so of course it's alluring. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and I, you know, there's only so many things that are cine cinematographically like being done in such a captivating way these days. So powerful. Yeah. Way. Oh, it's beautifully, it's beautifully filmed. Well, I, I recommend yeah. seeing it, even though I felt I kind of felt left the theater feeling like kind of like uh, I didn't feel good or energized leaving the theater, <laughs> but it's I still, it's still a good film. 
it's still, still a good film. I've still got to see the second one, but all with right, Tol- guys. You probably agree with Tolkien, right, Nate? The, uh, <laughs> yeah, he disliked it with what did he say? I disliked it with some intensity. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, but no, but I still like I respect the artistry of the, the the actual filmmaking. So it's like, and it it's well acted, mostly. Not every performance is great, but uh, um, and it's beautifully shot. I mean, it's just it's it's stunning. Yeah, and it's a compelling story as long as you're conscious of like, yeah. as long as you're yeah. like aware that this is not the that he's not the guy. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You better, you better watch more, more like you would Breaking Bad. Right? Yeah, exactly. Actually, you know what I thought of Justin is like. So I think Donny Villeneuve, in because he was consciously presenting it in the right way, he wanted you to to realize he wasn't good. I've got a yeah. hot take. So, <laughs> but I, I think. Well, hold on a second. I just want to finish the thought. He, I, I think he accomplished much better than what Star Wars essentially failed to do with the transformation of from, of Anakin into Darth Vader. Like that never hit. It never landed with the audience. It never. Yep. But at least the, for my own reaction, it's like I, I, I was like I had the kind of proper horrified reaction of like, oh my goodness. Like yeah. so for me, it worked in Dune. The way in a way it never worked in Star Wars, but now go ahead, Christian. My hot take, my hot take is that it it uh, that kind of the story it's telling is almost the story of the Reformation with Martin Luther, mm. because there was like a post jihad after Martin Luther that wasn't really his intention. I don't know if that makes sense or not. Even though I mean, I guess the question could be did did Paul want the jihad or not? And I don't know enough enough about that. But it's like this religious war that. Yeah. We'll talk about it after you've seen it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've read the book, but I'm just, yeah, I'm still probably a little rusty on it. All right, stupid take. Anyways, all right, we'll, uh, I'm going to hit the bumper. We'll end this thing backstage. All right. It was all great right. hanging out with you guys. You too. Yeah, thank you. Hi, this is Christian Baxter, and you're listening to Yours Truly, a place we go to think out loud. <laughs>